I'm Juliette Morris. In Scenes of Crime today, we visit the Lake District, where 70 years ago, in this beautiful and much-loved part of England, two exotic travellers were caught up in a disturbing murder. But first, to a lake that should have been the perfect place for concealing a body. The haunting expanse of Wast Water, the deepest lake in England, never fails to make an impression. It seems a fitting setting for a drama, and one bleak February day, the icy depths of the lake offered up evidence of just that, the body of a murdered woman. Bill Patterson was leader of Wasdale Mountain Rescue for over 20 years. He recalls the sensation when the body was found. The case was of great interest to locals. It was most unusual for something like this to occur. So it, it had quite an impact on the, on the valley. I think the number of tourists coming to the lakeside obviously increased tremendously over the next few weeks. I don't know what they thought they were going to see, but um, being interested, they, they simply came and had a look to see where it all happened. Knowing Wast Water as I do, it would have seemed to me an ideal place to hide a body. Um, it's remote, it's very, very quiet usually, and the water is very, very deep. It shelves off quite quickly, and if um, you get it right, it's obviously you could hide a lot of bodies in there without them ever coming to light. But what makes the discovery of the body so amazing is that it happened by accident. It was 1983, and a French girl, Veronique Ma, who was on a walking holiday, went missing after leaving the youth hostel on the shores of the lake. Her disappearance sparked an intensive search that was to have momentous consequences. My role was obviously to coordinate the search, and to make sure we covered every eventuality, I suggested that the police search an area of the lake where people try to cross it. Now retired, police diver Bill Pierce was in charge of underwater operations. We'd been up there several times looking for her. We knew she wasn't in and we'd check all around the lake. It's a deep lake, but clearly if she'd fallen in, she would be near the side. So we'd go up and spend three days swimming around and then we'd go back to Lancashire and several months later we'd come back and this is what happened on this occasion. And on our way up, we received a call that, that a civilian diver, an amateur diver, had seen a package in the lake and the detective in charge uh, of the investigation, Peter Reed, the superintendent, he thought that maybe it was connected uh, to the case that we were working on. I had my doubts about that because we'd been called on, on many occasions to look for packages and it turned out harmless enough in most cases. This time it didn't. When we got there, the diver was actually uh, there waiting for us. We followed the boat out towards what they call the pinnacles and, and there we saw the uh, the package. It was actually in 30 meters of water, it was quite deep, it was getting to the limit that we could actually scuba dive. Now at 30 meters visibility is going a little bit but in Wast Water it's a terrifically clear lake and with a torch I could see quite clearly around there. There was a little silt down there which was billowing up but I saw this quite small package attached to a very heavy piece of, of uh, concrete pipe all tied up and the package was very small it certainly didn't look the length of a, of a body and the water down there is almost freezing so everything had been kept totally intact no deterioration in the tissue or anything as soon as it hit the surface however it started to rapidly decompose the smell was horrendous on the surface the superintendent in charge of the case then came around and, and very carefully we, we cut some of the rope because you couldn't see through this hessian cloth. You see it in carpet shops, uh, wrapping the carpet up. We undid it, and then we undid it, and sure enough, there was a body, very tightly uh, uh, um, tied up inside it, uh, with the knees drawn up to the chest and the, and the arms pulled down. So th that's why the, the body looked so small. The superintendent thought, well, you know, Veronique Ma, we found Veronique Ma. And, and he, you know, he said, well, at least, you know, we found a young lady that's gone missing. Now, when Veronique went missing, she was in hiking boots and, and outdoor clothes, so she could walk around the lake. This lady was dressed in very 70s style clothes. She'd got stiletto heels on. She'd got nylons and a suspender belt and a short skirt. It clearly wasn't Veronique Ma. So then they wondered, who have we got here? 
The dark and mysterious Wasp Water obviously had a story to tell, and the hunt for evidence began. We went back down, we put fresh divers in, and they found other evidence, uh, of which stuff came up in a bag, which was uh, clearly somebody belonging to an airline pilot, or somebody who flew planes, and there were books about flying and stuff like that. And that gave rise uh, to the conjecture that maybe a plane had flown along the lake and they'd thrown the body out and then the evidence out as it went along, but it would have been scattered far and wide. This was all within a 10 meter area of the body. It wasn't long before the lake yielded up the vital clue. A wedding ring with the inscription Margaret 111163 Peter. But who were Margaret and Peter? The search was on. It soon led to the leafy Surrey village of Cranley. In 1976, this was the home of a couple called Peter and Margaret Hogg. He was an airline pilot and she'd been an air stewardess. They'd been married for 13 years. But their marriage seemed to be a troubled one. And one day, Margaret went missing. Her disappearance may well be a mystery to this day if it hadn't been for the chance discovery of the body and the ring. They took photographs of the ring and the inscription and they put it in a lot of the national newspapers and it was one of the neighbours of the Hogs who said, oh, uh, you know, I, I know who this is, it's Peter and, and Margaret from next door or wherever. And they, they were married in, in such a time and, and she, went, she went missing, you know, some years ago. And that was how they knew who it was, that's how they discovered who it was. Eight years after her death, Peter Hogg was charged with the murder of his wife. At his trial at the Old Bailey, the full story behind the Lady in the Lake came out. He alleged that she was having an affair and had come home on this particular night and thrown it in his face that she was having an affair and all the rest of it. And he, for whatever reason, had murdered her. He then, I think he strangled her, he then wrapped her up in this essence cloth. Everything in the room he bundled into, um, it, it piled up and, and bundled up. He put it all in the back of the car complete with a little rubber dinghy. Peter Hogg set off on the 350 mile journey to the Lake District. He knew the area well, as he'd been at boarding school in Keswick and was still a frequent visitor. I didn't know the Hogg family personally, but I knew of Peter because he was a rock climber, came to this area quite regularly. Wast Water, with its sinister presence, seemed an appropriate setting for what Peter Hogg had in mind. It has this background of the screes, uh, on the other side, which make the lake quite often appear very, very somber and uh, forbidding. It's only a, a narrow lake, but these towering mountains uh, are right on the other side. And they cast a shadow over it, so it always looks dark and dismal. You rarely do have the sun shining there. But Peter Hogg was undeterred by Wast Water's seeming unfriendliness. Well, this is the road down which Peter would have driven on his way to Wast Water. It would have been extremely dark. Um, no moonlight whatsoever, I gather. It's difficult to know how Peter would have felt driving in such conditions with the body of his wife in the, back, the boot of his car, wondering what he was going to find when he arrived on the lakeside, whether he'd be able to safely dispose of the body or not without being seen. Here on the lakeside now, this is the first view that Peter would have seen if he could see anything that night. Wasswater is a very eerie lake at night. I think it would have been quite intimidating for anybody with the body in their boat. As far as we're aware, this is the point where Peter Hogg arrived with his car uh, containing a, an inflatable boat. His wife, we believe, wrapped in a carpet, a concrete block, and then he somehow managed to get them all into uh, the water and drive to a point where he thought it was safe to dispose of the body. Must have been quite a feat because an inflatable boat on this water is not very easy to um, manoeuvre, and getting the body over the side without uh, tipping himself into the water must have been quite an achievement. 
Margaret Hogg might well have stayed forever in her watery grave if it weren't for one of Wasp Water's most unique characteristics. The lake is shallow around the edge with a shelving system that drops off deeply further out. Either bad luck or misjudgment meant that Peter Hogg dropped the body onto a shelf only 30 metres down. Had you drawn across on the lake, the body had been put almost exactly in the centre of the lake. Had it been some 10 metres further out, it would have been in 90 metres of water and could have been a, we couldn't have recovered it at that point. Nobody would have seen it. Peter Hogg was tried for murder at the Old Bailey. His defence cited provocation caused by his wife's alleged unfaithfulness. The jury returned a verdict of manslaughter and Hogg was sentenced to four years in prison. Shortly after the trial, the remains of the French girl Veronique Ma were discovered on Broken Rib Crag, high above the lake. The victim of a tragic accident, she'd evidently fallen from the cliff above. Over the years, other lives have been lost in the lake, and they doubtless hold more secrets in their depths. But Wasp Water is unlikely to forget Margaret Hogg, the lady in the lake. When she was recovered and after the trial and all the rest of it, and, uh, and she was cremated, her ashes were thrown on the lake, you know, I guess the spirit's there and it's still there. In a moment on Scenes of Crime, another chilling tale, when we visit an eerie lakeside wood that 70 years ago was witness to the murder of a wealthy Chinese bride. Welcome back, I'm Juliette Morris. A picturesque and peaceful village on Derwent Water in the Lake District is the setting for our second scene of crime, where one summer in 1928, unusual visitors came to stay. Derwent Water in the North Lakes is a popular beauty spot, attracting lots of holiday makers and honeymooners. But one newly married couple who came here in 1928 didn't live happily ever after, for a murder took place that was to stun the whole community. Local historian George Bott has long been fascinated by the case. The impact of this murder in a tiny village in the heart of the Lake District was very, very strong indeed. It just wasn't something that was to be expected. So I think we can be quite sure that um, it was very, very unusual and it was talked about a great deal and in fact, of course, still is. This case was particularly intriguing because of the exotic and glamorous nature of the couple involved. The two people in the heart of this story, of course, are the two Chinese people. Uh, one who was called Wai and the other one Chung. The two of them had met actually in New York in the previous year at some sort of festival. Wai was a very, very rich woman. She'd been presented at Buckingham Palace and she'd met King George and uh, she was regarded, I would say, as one of the wealthiest women in China. Chung, on the other hand, was a law student. We do know that he had an allowance, not a very big one, something like $200 a month or something, uh, from his father. But, I mean, his wealth was nothing compared to the massive fortune, really, that, uh, that Wai was, Wai had. Wai and Chung chose the Lake District as their honeymoon destination. And in June 1928, they arrived at Keswick Station. They went to the tiny village of Grange at the foot of Derwent Water. There they booked into the Borrowdale Gates Hotel, which is now run by Terry and Christine Parkinson. When we bought the hotel, we didn't know anything of the story at all. Shortly after we got here, I believe one of the guests mentioned that there had been a Chinese couple staying here, uh, and a murder eventually was committed. I would have thought it was most unusual to have two Chinese, two people from China come to stay in Grange in Borrowdale, especially when one thinks about the transport and the very narrow, twisty road from Keswick. So how on earth they got here and found their way to Grange in Borrowdale, I can't imagine, but anyway, uh, they did, and we all know how it ended. <laughs> Wai and Chung arrived on a chilly June day. The next afternoon, like so many holiday makers before them, they set out on a walk to enjoy the fresh air and scenery. Being so conspicuous, several people in the village noticed their comings and goings. Later in the afternoon, Chan arrived back at the hotel alone. 
He explained his wife's absence by saying that she'd gone into Keswick to buy warm underwear. He ate a solitary dinner and then went to bed, saying he'd caught a cold. This, we think, is the room where the couple actually stayed. It's been altered a great deal, as you can imagine, over the years. Uh, we do know, for example, there's a fireplace, because the couple asked for a fire, saying, although it was June, it was rather cold. And remember, Chung did say that Y had gone into Keswick to get some warmer underclothes. But while Chung was eating and sleeping an apparently untroubled man, a dreadful discovery was about to be made in the quaintly named Kamakata Wood. Only a few hundred yards from the village, the wood was a popular place to walk, and Wai and Chung had been spotted there earlier in the day. This is Kamakata Wood, and even on a day like today, when the wind's howling and the rain's blowing, it's got an eerie sort of atmosphere about it. It was here, at 7.30pm, that the terrible discovery was made. Although nobody's absolutely certain of the exact spot, as far as I know, I think it was probably something rather like this place, where you've got a couple of boulders, you've got a rock behind, and you've got almost a, a tailor-made coffin in which to leave the body. The trees and undergrowth of Kamakata Wood might have concealed the crime for a long time, if it hadn't been for a keen-eyed passerby. Mr. Wilson was a local farmer and he was taking his dog for a walk. I think he probably must have done this hundreds of times in this particular wood. And um, he was just walking along the path and saw the umbrella sticking up behind a rock and obviously went to investigate. A closer look revealed a body, that of a Chinese woman. There was no doubt how she died. The body was found with three cords round its neck, one of which had certainly been used to strangle her. The others had been put there later, according to the local doctor. There had been some disturbance of her clothing, but there was no signs of any assault of any kind. And rings were missing from her finger, and a necklace was missing. Whether indeed she was wearing the necklace at the time, I think is perhaps a bit doubtful. But one very important thing was that she still had on her wrist uh, an expensive platinum watch. And it was pretty obvious to the inspector who um, did this case that it couldn't have been a murder for uh, robbery. The community, I'm sure, were completely shocked and surprised by the very idea of a murder taking place in their midst, and particularly as this was a, a foreign tourist. And we can be quite sure that um, when Mr. Wilson got back to the village with his story and passed it on to the other villagers, that they would be very, very surprised, very, very shocked indeed. Back at the hotel, Chung was asleep. At 11 p.m. he was woken by the police to tell him that a body had been found. The body of Y, his bride of only five weeks. Inspector Graham at the local constabulary was put in charge of the investigation. He was soon at the scene of the crime, along with a photographer called Mason. The inspector asked him to take Chung's camera and a couple of exposed films and see if they would produce any evidence. In the meantime, Inspector Graham began a search of the couple's hotel room. If Chung wasn't already a suspect, his actions soon aroused suspicion. Inspector Graham, in his searches, uh, discovered a, a jewel case, and he asked Chung for the key of this, and Chung said he didn't know where the key was. Well, Graham apparently continued to search, and he found the key in a case uh, inside some clothes belonging to Chung, obviously put there by Chung, and when he unlocked the case, there was a lot of the jewellery, a wallet, a necklace. But this was a very vital piece of evidence because Chung had obviously tried to put them off the scent. But what about the two rings which were important? And um, there's a nice little twist in the story here because Ralph Mason, the photographer, when he went back to his studio in Keswick, he opened one of the films. Now, in those days, films were, were wrapped up in a sort of wax paper. And as he undid the wax paper of one of these films, exposed films, he found a ring at one end. He opened the other end, and there was the second ring. Now, these were Chung's films, 
which again is an absolutely damning bit of evidence that he was responsible for whatever had happened. So really, Inspector Graham had sufficient evidence, I think, to uh, charge Ch Yung Chung with the murder. At the police station, Chung denied everything. The story was widely reported in the press, and colourful details of the case, such as his cold-blooded eating of dinner after the killing, turned it into one of the popular melodramas of the day. At the preliminary hearing at Keswick Magistrates, Chung continued to plead his innocence. But at his trial at Carlisle Assizes, he was convicted of murder. He was hanged in December 1928. Y was buried in Crosswaite Churchyard in Keswick. After the trial, her body was exhumed and returned to China. It had seemed at first a simple case of murder for profit, but the twist was yet to come. The motive of get rich quick wasn't one because if by Chinese law his wife was dead, he would no longer have control over his wife's fortune. Another possible suggestion is that apparently the Chinese uh, placed a great deal of um, credit on having children in keeping up the family tradition. And it was discovered that Y could not have children. But the final piece in the puzzle was revealed when a secret in Chang's past came to light. The strongest motive for the murder seems to have been that Chung was already married. Before he left China to go to America to do his law studies, apparently he had married and for about two months had lived with his wife in China. So he obviously realised that he would be convicted, he could be convicted of bigamy if he was found out. And so did he take the way out that many a harassed husband has done when he wants to, he's got himself into a mess maritally and uh, decided that he would murder his second wife. It's only a suggestion. I don't know that we shall ever know the motives, the real motives. Even the prettiest settings can witness the ugliest scenes. Join me, Juliet Morris, next time on Scenes of Crime.